Presidente. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for joining our online briefing. Today we'll discuss why uh, people are arrested today, why they're sent to prison, why the Belarusian journalist experienced this. My name is uh, Natalia Gatievska, I represent Belarusian Press Club and moderate today's meeting. I will present our speakers. Igor Ilyash, husband of Katerina Andreeva, journalist and co-author of the Belarus, Belarusian Donbass book of investigations. Next, Alexander Lukashuk, who is director of the Belarusian service of Radio Liberty. Hello, Alexander. Uh, Sergei Pulsha, editor of the Novichas newspaper. Anastasia Roda, director of the Nasha Niva media outlet. Before I give floor to speakers, uh, try to describe briefly the situation that is happening now in Belarus and the conditions where independent media and journalists find themselves in. According to the Human Rights Center of Vyasna in Belarus, 1,216 political prisoners and the number is growing. Out of them, 27 journalists, 37 people are journalists. If we add here the people uh, who are arrested, I mean, the bloggers, uh, publicists, and experts, the number will double. Uh, in comparison in Russia, for example, according to the Memorial Human Rights Center, there are 442 political prisoners, of whom 355 uh, uh, were charged on religious reasons. The mass repressions against journalists and blues have been going on for two years. The sites of the independent media outlets are blocked in Belarus. Uh, the materials, social feeds, and uh, uh, considered uh, extremist for providing any information of um, information, independent information. Uh, Belarusian citizens are fined and sent in prison due to war in Ukraine. The persecution of the Belarusian media got even more acute. All around the countries, uh, people are violently detained, kidnapped, and uh, they're uh, charged with uh, many extremist uh, things like treason against the state or extremist formations. This is not the whole list of charges that uh, the Belarusian independent journalists are facing these days. And they get real uh, terms for that. At the beginning of May, uh, the authorities detained the regional journalist Yuri Gonsnevich. Here, he is actually charged with uh, abiding with extremists for sending pics of Russian military equipment and uh, taking pictures of it and sending to independent media. Um, on the 18th of May, the director of the independent economic media outlet Belarusian um, Rinak, Belarusian Market, Belarusian Market were detained. Konstantin Zlatych. Only a week later, human rights centers, human rights uh, lawyers found him in uh, Zhodina prison. Until now, there have been no details ab about uh, his detention because his uh, lawyer signed the, uh, the paper. And uh, according to his wife, he's uh, a uh, charged with uh, um, again the usual crimes. The Bill of Pan Mount, Andrei Alexandrov, who is um, Andrei Irina Levshina, a former director, Dmitry Navazilov, are charged with uh, actions, organizing actions that uh, break the public order, high treason, and tax evasion. Irina Levshina, Dmitry Navazilov, are facing seven years in prison, while Andrei Alexandrov is facing up to 15 years in colony. An important nuance in this case that authorities have recognized the Bill of Pardon extremist formation, but nowhere we can find an official information that Bill of Pardon is no longer an official media outlet. It is still officially registered media outlet in Belarus. The political prisoners in the prison are psychologically and physically abused they're not allowed to get a medical access a medical attention 
They don't get parcels and letters. They uh, cannot have communication with other prisoners and inmates. They need to wear special tags on their clothes. They put in the uh, other colonies and spend sent to other colonies information that's been hidden from lawyers. But despite all these threats, media and journalists continue working and telling people what is happening in Ukraine. From the first day of war, Belarusian media outlets, not for a second, stopped covering the events and they call in the the war the war of war at least seven media outlets zerkala you radio nasha niva the village belarus internet newspaper solidarnost and regional media uh, media palacea have been blocked by the journal prosecutor's office in russia now i would like to give floor to uh igor Ilyash, who's a journalist and husband of uh, journalist Katerina Andreeva, who is a Belsa journalist. Igor lives and works in Belarus despite the uh, threats and persecutions. His wife, since November 2020, has been in prison in February 2021. Katerina was given two years in prison for streaming a, a protest rally in Minsk, but not so long ago, she was charged again. Igor, please tell us more about this, the recent charges. How did you learn about this? And uh, what do you know about the new trial that she's facing? Hello, colleagues. Indeed, uh, Katerina has been in prison for 18 point and a half months. And on the 5th of September, she was supposed to uh, be set free, but in 2022, in February, uh, the new criminal cha charges were put on her. We didn't know anything about her status and about the article she was charged with and about the crime. We only knew that she was moved to a temporary detention center for some procedural actions. And then we learned what was happening when she was charged again. It happened at the beginning of. Uh, March and uh, she was charged with high treason um, and she's facing 7 to 15 years in prison. In fact, there was very, very little information. We know only three things for sure that it's the article 356 that she's charged under, that uh, it's the Gomez Regional Court where the case will be heard. And it's the KGB of the Gomez region in charge of the case. We don't know if uh, what uh, were the actions that became the foundation of this criminal case. It is totally possible that if the court happens, we will not know this after this, because uh, if we talk about uh, high treason, it is very possible that the um, case will be top secret only if the authorities, the secret services, do not want to um, unveil information through some leaks and propagandist uh, telegram channels. The only thing is uh, clear is that it has, it's about work journalist activity. This is clear. And uh, actually it is seen from the situation because Kat Katarina has been in jail for 18 and a half months for her journalist activities. She was charged for um, making the stream for broadcasting. So it wasn't even um, hidden. Nothing new could happen over the last 18 and a half months. I mean, it was impossible to find uh, reasons to charge her with high treason. Again, I believe it again has to do with her previous activities as a journalist. Unfortunately, we don't know what it is exactly. We learned not so long ago that the trial will be held in May, but but it was based on the experience from the first trial because after the uh, investigation was uh, finished was a month until the case was sent to court. We had a similar forecast from her lawyers. 
So we thought that the trial was to be held in, in, the, in, the big, in the middle of May. Unfortunately, it was postponed. So I uh, believe it may happen in, Ju in June, but uh, this is not a must. So if it's again postponed until July, it would not be a, a violation of the procedural norms. So with the framework of this criminal case, uh, she was, he can be held uh, in prison for longer. No violations here. Again, we don't know what this postponement, postponement is uh, connected with. Katerina is feeling more or less fine uh, as much as it's possible in the prison conditions. She writes poems. Not so long ago, I posted on Facebook one of her poems. She writes letters. So her letters are received by her relatives and they received them promptly. So she's not complaining uh, about the conditions in the temporary detention center. Could, when was the last time that you met when you saw Katerina? It happened a week before the authorities started a new criminal case against her. At the time, and I uh, would like to highlight this, there were no signals, uh, no suspicion that something like this may happen. It was a short meeting through a glass, through a um, telephone. At the time, we had were making plans. We could uh, count, make, start the countdown. And oh, once again, I never received any signals. She never received any signals that uh, something like this could happen. It was uh, totally unexpected detention center. We knew that something really bad was happening and she could face some awful charges. And uh, indeed, this is exactly what happened. The Stalinist style charges um, without a doubt, they have nothing to do with reality. And Katerina is innocent. Thank you very much, Igor. That's a small detail, technical detail for people who are listening to us, I can see us. The first speakers will make uh, the presentations that will have a Q&A. If you already have some questions and uh, you want to clarify something, please write your questions in the chat. Those watching us on YouTube, please do the same. We will definitely read them out. On the 8th of June, we will um, have a closed uh, trial under Andrei Kuznetsky, the Radio Liberty journalist. He was detained in November 2021, but we found out what he's charged with only on the evil of the trial. Again, two more journalists of the uh, Radio Liberty journalist, Alia Gruzilovich, uh, who was uh, charged, uh, was uh, sentenced to 1.5 years in prison, and Igor Losev, who has been in prison for two years, and he was sentenced to 15 years in prison. Information about these two uh, sentenced journalists will come from Director of Radio Liberty Media Outlet, Alexander Lukashuk. Thank you very much, much Natalia. It was very hard to listen to what Igor told us, whose wife is uh, behind bars, and the only way of communicating with her is uh, writing letters. I'll show the people who we are talking about. Their pictures are here in my uh, office. Igor Losik was arrested uh, on the 25th of August 2021, and Rikuznechik and uh, Alia Gruzdilovich were uh, was arrested in 2021. Overall, the dozens of journalists from various media outlets were arrested in Belarus. Um, after 2020, we had uh, 10 people arrested working for us. Some of them were sentenced several times. 
and they were fined. And now we have three of these sentences. On the two days ago, the Supreme Court of Belarus rejected the appellation of Igor Losik and other people. And uh, he still uh, he was still sentenced to 15 years in prison. He will be transferred some colony from the government prison. Natalia said already that we expect a new trial to be held next week. It is uh, uh, we are worried about this because he will be charged uh, with the participation in the extremist formation. After Andre was arrested and after Radio Liberty was officially recognized an extremist media outlet. Before that, we were we lost our accreditation and the majority of our journalists had to leave the country. As of today, when we meet uh, with, in the framework of our press club meetings, 1,180 days of journalist work were lost. I mean, because that's how many days our journalists spent in prison since 2020. And every day this number is growing. Will soon be just as long as the Second World War. The big problem is when journalists are in prison is the issue of communication and the issue of support. We long ago lost the possibility to send some notes that would reach our people, at least from abroad. International solidarity protest uh, happening with the participation of politicians and ag activists taking part. The head of the Senate sent letters to our journalists, among others. This year, I sent to eight those journalists a welcoming uh, words from the Gibraltar. I was right that I'm on the, on the edge of Europe, but I remember about you. Europe is no, is not yet free, and I doubt that at least one letter of mine reached them in time. So we had to publish this again. Natalia told you about details uh, about uh, the trials and tribulations of those people, but I'm particularly worried about the issues of, and questions of what we can do in such a situation. This is an issue of providing assistance and that our journalists uh, who are behind bars and uh, their family members are asking. This is the issue of visa, of a one-off, um, financial assistance of uh, employment. I would be interested to learn if the journalists that are currently behind bars still receive uh, their salaries from their employers. And if uh, with uh, with the companies like Radio Liberty, it's much easier. What do companies like Bilapanto or Nasha Niva? They are less financially stable. Can they continue providing financial support to their journalists? And at what level? Another victim of uh, journalistic arrests is uh, the audience that uh, is deprived of a very important social, political, intellectual product that these journalists can no longer make. A single person, a colleague of ours who um, is arrested, is not just one person less. It's the uh, 
issues arise in terms of management and we lose our energy time and the audience suffers every time when they arrest one journalist they in fact uh, making a blow on uh, our audience journalists and uh, should be protected just like uh, the life of the people soldiers at war every journalist lost in this war conducted by the Russian authorities against independent journalism is uh, equals to losses not only of journalist community but of the society as a whole i believe uh, every step we can make together with the press club with our colleagues in support of our colleagues is uh, contributing to our victory in the future in the future thank you alexander now i'd like to give floor to our next speaker sergey pulsha on the 8th of june uh, there'll be a trial of Aksana Kolb, the chief editor of the Novet Chas newspaper. In prison are also two journalists of this newspaper, investigative journalist Denise Vashin and Nikolai Tidok. What do you know about them as of today? Sergey, please, the floor is yours. Uh, hello, everyone. Usually when I participated in such conferences, I was from another side and human rights activist spoke a lot uh, about death penalty. And, and usually they said that uh, the major issue that people are facing in this situation is that uh, the situation when they don't know what will happen. They don't know, didn't know what will happen to them. Their relatives didn't know what will happen with them. They didn't know about the conditions and the articles used against them. Therefore, the situation is as such, is the same as uh, as it is usually what we're facing with. We know that Aksana is charged with activities that uh, break the public order, but what were those actions and how it's connected with the uh, um, media outlet? Is it at all connected with it? We don't know all this. All these points, all these things are unclear to us and will be unclear to us until the trial is held. We don't know if it will be an open trial or it will be a trial behind bars. I think the same is true about Denis Sebastian. We know that uh, he was charged with uh, some unclear things like uh, discrediting a state statesmen, state officials, and some po policemen. But the thing is, Sebastian was busy investigating things and those investigations involve using uh, information from open sources so he could not find uh, any uh, any secrets that uh, could be official secrets it's all open information so the charges he's facing are very far-fetched at least that's what we think about them the same is true about Mikola Didok we know that he was detained not only for journalistic activity but also as an active participant of the anarchist movement we basically don't get any letters from him we don't know where he's kept how he's doing We don't know the conditions in which he's held, whether he's under pressure or not. Basically, this is the information isolation. So it's not only isolation of him. As a prisoner, but also 
it's information isolation of as we are isolated and uh, so are his relatives and uh, the audience what to do with it how to break through this wall i think it's uh, we can only resort to writing letters only Aksana is getting letters she's uh, heading in there she's writing letters and uh, join comic books only from her that we learn what is happening there official bodies don't tell us anything he's a lawyer signed a non-discretion uh, paper we we'll only have to wait for the trial and hope that something will be will learn something there Uh, Denis Ivashin, according to his wife, Olga Ivashna, was at least for five months in a total information isolation. And uh, he was very often in solitary confinement. And uh, for five months, he didn't get any parcels from his mother or wife or any letters from them. Can you comment on this? Basically, the same is happening with us. We did send him letters. We didn't get any replies from him. So, it, obviously, they didn't reach him. The same is true about uh, Mikolai Zadok. We don't have any information from him. Aksana, thank God, can receive letters for now. We hope this will continue. Thank you very much, Sergei. And uh, now I'd like to give floor to the director of Nasha Niva, Astasia Roda. Uh, they paid communal services uh, for the ter using the tariffs of uh, physical persons and not um, business entities. Therefore, Yegor Martinovich and uh, head of uh, um, advertisement uh, department, Andris Korko, was sent to prison for two years, even though they uh, paid off all the debts. The Ministry of Agency no longer had any uh, any problems with them not paying anything. What do we know about their colleagues, Anastasia? I'm very happy to see all of you. Unfortunately, it's a bad things that we're discussing today. Unfortunately, our colleagues are facing bad news in the in the sense that we're still facing two and a half years in uh, prison and uh, the appellation was or the appeal was cancelled uh, what we know from people who write to them is that they get letters from their relatives and all other letters are sent to garbage bin not so long ago they met with their relatives it's uh, they're very happy to see them they're in high spirits but they're very uh, uh, they're very weak in the sense that uh, they have been for a long time in the close space without free air without fresh air they uh, cannot do sports and uh, keep fit and uh, you can see by looking at them that their physical health has been undermined Overall, what I wanted to say about the situation is uh, Igor told us about Katarina, I and I remember very well uh, her trial. And we then thought that this is a crazy sentence and the girls would be free much earlier than this. After a while, 
we thought was uh, they would be out. I mean, if if they spend the whole term behind bars, and uh, the thing, the fact that they are facing another sentence, uh, which is very long, it's awful, and I think this is. Um, uh, actually some retaliation for her activities and we know that any journalist can be charged with anything and can be behind bars indefinitely this is awful because we're all in such situation 27 people are behind bars we see that people that they are not let out of prison so they are kept in prison for for longer charged with some criminal activities again in, the, in such conditions we cannot even imagine how we can renew our work in belarus Igor losik was arrested before the election in 2020 and was sentenced to 15 years in prison belarus and rinak uh, editor was also arrested aksana kop is among the journalists that are behind bars. Novotas was the only media outlet, the only newspaper that political prisoners, the people in prison could read because, and now all the independent news media are not allowed in, uh, in prisons. Only the so-called right, the proper media outlets are uh, remaining. We see the repression getting harder. Some uh, media outlets were recognized as uh, extremist formations. So I don't know what, 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 what will be the next step. Uh, some bloggers were recognized as terrorists. We believe that this may continue. This is a catastrophe because nobody thought that it would uh, last that long. That the authorities will try to burn out and the media field create intolerable conditions for all of us and basically destroy independence independence independent journalism in belarus and uh, there are, we're afraid that not only journalists will be persecuted, but also members of their families. Sometimes they are also under pressure, they are arrested. The relatives of journalists are under pressure because the authorities this way want to pressure journalists into giving up, into leaving the job. And this is totally abnormal. Nastasia, as far as I know, Nasha Niva uh, is also recognized in extremist formation. Not all, only her, its uh, stories, but also media outlet. Indeed. Um, and uh, is it possible for readers to receive information? How do they read your information, get access to it? I think it was an attack not on our audience, but on us as a journalist team, journalistic team, because people who are working for us feel the most dangerous. And we don't have any, almost any journalists who work under their own name as far as the audience is concerned. People in Belarus are so tired of these limitations when hundreds of media outlets and blogger channels uh, have been recognized as extremists. Currently, this no longer works because it's impossible to be afraid of everything. Whatever you open, whatever you read, unless it's a, a pro-governmental outlet, there's a 80% chance that it has been recognized an extremist formation. So impossible to keep track of all of them. And I think the authorities, uh, they uh, 
they made a mistake that they depreciated the, this measure because when the the first media outlet some media outlet were uh, recognized as extremist the remaining media outlets were trying to keep to the rules set by the authorities when everyone is recognizing extremist formation it doesn't really matter you keep working using the all the standards that were there before 2020 disregarding on the quirky limitations that were imposed on us by the authorities now we work in according to the journalist standards they try to keep to under current conditions when well, we don't have communication with the state agencies state authorities and uh, enterprises and everything concerning the state and agencies is limited we are much limited in communication and getting information talking about the objective normal journalism is impossible in such condition because we do want to cover things but we can only talk with these persons and the private individuals and this is a catastrophe that our characters have to um, become anonymous because they're afraid of getting arrested because this is exactly what is happening it is a real feat to do journalism in such conditions um, because the authorities are doing everything to destroy us to destroy our profession Thank you very much, Nastasia. Uh, colleagues, dear colleagues the, who are viewing us and uh, listening to us, now we'll have a Q&A session. Speakers are ready to answer your questions. Please write your questions in the chat. I'll be reading them aloud. I have two questions that uh, I already see. Martin Kaloski, a journalist from Macedonia, is asking, he wrote two questions the first one being what is the article what is the punishment is uh, what are the main charges that the journalists are facing as far as i know colleagues at least in the past it was the organizing actions that are violating public order or participation in them tax evasion this is as far as i know maybe you could add this also spreading extremist information when for example the zirkala media outlet when it was recognizing extremist formation extremist outlet or and all the all the stories recognized as extremist and if you uh, reprint the stories in some i mean if somebody else reprints that uh, you, you could be arrested you could be uh, searched and so on could be also charged because the therefore uh, the other media outlets in belarus had to delete the links to the officially extremist formations to avoid this persecution and, and for example they had to deal with the decades of links and stories and those uh, you can see that those uh, things were working backwards now almost any media outlets can be charged with that being extremist formation Nastasia is muted. Colleagues, maybe you have something to add. Maybe I forgot to mention some charges that a journalist are facing. Apart from organizing activities that uh, violate public order and uh, grand scale tax evasion, it's also mm, state treason and 
distribution of uh, extremist materials and stories. Nastasi, you here? Yes, I've uh, actually said everything I wanted. We had a small glitch. I would like to have a short commentary, make short commentary. In the West, politicians do ask these questions, but we know that the situation in Belarus can be described as the legal default. Any article of criminal code can be applied to any journalist. It could be a tax evasion. For example, when they don't pay their utilities or not payment of utilities, this is absurd. And they put people in prison for this and then charge them with organizing riots. So it's impossible. It's important what I would pay attention to. It's important that the uh, lawyers disappeared, defense lawyers have disappeared. I mean, they have not in place of saying, uh, not in the position of saying anything, of defending their clients. Wives don't know what is happening with their husbands, don't know what their husbands are charged with. And they don't know, not because it's a big secret, because it, but because it doesn't make sense, it doesn't have any meaning. Thank you, Alexander. Next question from Martin Kowalski, journalist from Macedonia. Martin is asking, is there any number of journalists who were forced to leave the country after the protest in 2020? As far as I know, we don't have a concrete number. Or to be clear, it's impossible, or almost impossible to know this now because for for safety reasons, because journalists have to uh, keep themselves safe. Many of them have to move from one country from another due to legalization issues. And many journalists who abolition journalists were living in Ukraine, but after the war started, they had to leave Ukraine. And now it's impossible to know how many exactly, how many journalists exactly left the country. Uh, colleagues, you may have some information about this. I would also add that, unfortunately, we not only don't know how many people have left, I, I, it would be easier to uh, f find out how many people, how many journalists have left, I'm still remaining in Belarus. Many, some media outlets would try to evacuate people from Belarus. Cooperation with the people staying in Belarus is anonymous. Very few journalists are remaining in Belarus. Another problem is that some journalists are leaving this profession, leaving this job because the risk is too high and unacceptable for people because they may have small children or parents uh, elderly parents they have to take care of. So uh, they cannot allow uh, to stay in prison for half a year, for several years. And we see that uh, the precedents when mothers of multiple children are kept in prison for long years, many years. The, and the authorities don't care about this. They still impose sentences on such people. Thus many people are leaving the, the journalistic job, at least for this during this uh, bad period. We hope that when things clear out, things improve, the people will come back. Thank you, Anastasia. Before I read the next questions, I have uh, several comments here. Martin asked additional question. Are there any non-state initiatives and uh, organizations that are following uh, the trials and publishing uh, in the results? It's the Human Rights Center, Vyasna. The, you can Google their website. It's the Human Rights Center, Vyasna. They uh, have statistics there about the articles and charges that are 
political prisoners are facing. As far as the concrete people are concerned, there is a there is an association of journalists. Journalists, those have their website where they publish statistics about this. You can also get in touch with them and receive information on this. The Polish journalist Krzysztof Bocek is asking, can he um, get additional information from any over all the speakers today? So my question is, can I provide your contact information to Krzysztof? No, no problem with that. The next question from Krzysztof. Is it true that the majority of Belarusian journalists have moved to Poland, relocated to Poland? Well, it's not exactly true, Krzysztof. One of the main countries where Belarusian journalists had to move was Ukraine, followed by Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, Georgia, and uh, several others. So journalists uh, were leaving Belarus for any country they could. So Poland is the only, it's not the only country where Belarusian journalists live. Natalia, I need to add that the Polish side uh, uh, helped a lot with uh, humanitarian visas together with Lithuanians, and uh, we would like to thank them for this. We're expecting that uh, starting from July, the Belarusians uh, may have a uh, few problems with legalizing their status and get legal status. We hope that some of them will return, but unfortunately, we're now. Uh, many of them are working from abroad, and we don't know what when things will improve. So the possibilities of working abroad is uh, very relevant today. Other journalists uh, are asking if they can get contact information of the speakers, today's speakers. As far as I understand, I can share your contact information with them, and they will contact you further for additional comments. The next question is asked by Natalia Gorechka. Is there any statistics about the criminal articles that are used against journalists? Is there a sample of uh, applications um, uh, Um, used to contact the international organizations that could help bring to responsibility the authorities for doing this. I know that in some cases uh, there are single cases for doing this, but again, I believe this question should be asked to the Association of Journalists and Human Rights Center Vesna. So maybe media outlets can say if they have their own initiative or it's done through the BAJ. As far as the uh, international institutions are concerned, they don't accept such applications in bulk from media outlets or from, from the public. It is the person who has suffered the, the persecution or who is in prison that um, are supposed to apply to them or file this application. So uh, this is question not to us. Should The question should be addressed to the defense lawyers and to people who are supposed to file this complaint because these are the rule, they are personal and very individual. But yeah. to file this complaint, we're doing our best to support this process. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to add that as far as the 
complaints to international organizations are concerned, applications are concerned. Uh, we are planning to international to apply to International Human Rights Court about the Katarina and Dalia, our colleagues, journalist. Several months ago, I uh, sent a complaint to uh, UN uh, Human Rights Court about the recognition of our book as extremist. I just wanted to thank the journalists who keep telling people about this, telling the audience about this, because unfortunately, we don't see the authorities trying to uh, set our colleagues free. Although traditionally, the journalists usually uh, at the forefront of all activities. And of course, journalists are facing the biggest pressure. They usually guaranteed safety, unfortunately, it doesn't work in Belarus. And it's impossible important to keep this topic on the agenda so that uh, we could always say that journalists must not be held uh, behind bars. Just like uh, over 1,200 political prisoners in Belarus, but journalists as a special group, unfortunately, face the, uh, the same pressure as everyone else. So we don't know whether they will be released before the end of their sentence or they could face some new charges. Thank you, Nastasia. I have a question from, from our YouTube viewer, Katerina, question to Igor Ilyash. Do, does, does your wife uh, get uh, letters from other people, not from you or relatives? Indeed. Since the time she was moved to the temporary detention uh, center, she received only several letters. So she gets almost nothing else. As far as I know, other political prisoners of ours do not get anything or get almost nothing from uh, non-relatives. The same is true about Igor Losik and others. We have several more minutes remaining for our meeting. We have a question from our friend journalist, Clément Levelus. He's asking if international pressure had any influence on Belarus authorities when we talk about the release, and release of journalists. Uh, if there was more of such pressure, would it affect the situation would it help uh, get uh, the release of journalists or have them released? Uh, can we witness any international pressure right now? And if it was more of it, do you think it was would affect the policies of Belarusian authorities? Would it help secure their release? Uh, for now, it's difficult to say if uh, did have uh, influence and what kind of influence it was, but I'm confident that this, if this topic remains on the agenda, if it's still under discussion, sooner or later it will make sense because if everybody forgets about it, if it becomes the, the so-called new norm that the Belarusians, uh, Belarusian journalists are supposed to be kept in prison, and if uh, the new journalists know that if they get into this profession, they would face 10 years in prison. This is awful. This is not acceptable. So uh, we would ask you to keep this on the agenda, to keep telling the audience that the journalist uh, uh, journalism is wiped out in Belarus so that people around the world will know the truth. And the fact that there are still people who are ready to work and uh, to get this message across to people. This is a great achievement. Thank you, Anastasia. Sergey, please. 
Without a doubt, this uh, influence is felt, but we do not always see this uh, influence. There are some movements, some changes inside of this whole situation. Something is changing, but most importantly, to know how this, how your solidarity is influencing us, your colleagues, we feel very uh, big inspiration from this and big support. We are happy to see that this topic is raised and kept on the agenda, but not only by us, but also by our colleagues, our international colleagues. We know that we are not left alone and it gives us, uh, stimulates us to work further, to do what we have always been doing. I totally agree. I just wanted to add that international organizations like Freedom House and others that provide practical assistance to journalists and uh, relatives, they also uh, highlight the actions of their politicians. When politicians support the freedom of press in Belarus, they give him a, a list of NGOs. Those and journalists I can't say they're unlucky, but the things that happened after 2020, like uh, evacuation from Af Afghanistan, war in Ukraine, of course, this draws attention and journalistic resources and solidarity resources uh, draws us away from Belarus. And when our colleagues, journalists from abroad, can uh, change the situation and uh, keep attention, more attention. Uh, Belarus will be all very grateful. Thank you very much. Colleagues, if you have something more to add, please, uh, now is the time. If you wanted, if you said everything you wanted, uh, I guess we could uh, be closing out today's mission meeting, online briefing. Colleagues, do you have anything to add? Fine, so uh, I believe uh, our online briefing is nearing the end. I, I would like once again to thank our speakers for their time, for uh, telling us in detail about what is happening with uh, political prisoners and uh, our colleagues in particular. I would like to thank you, our international colleagues, the viewers and listeners who took part in our briefing. And Thank you very much for um, bringing this information to international community. I'd like to thank you once again. I will send all the information of our speakers to you for uh, additional communication. Thank you once again, and let's keep in touch.